Welcome to the Independent Dealer Podcast with hosts Luke Godwin and Jeff Watson, a podcast by dealers for dealers. Here we go. Hello, guys and girls, gals and boys, wheelers and dealers. This is the Independent Dealer Podcast brought to you by Buckeye Dealership Consulting. Luke, we are at it again. We're back at our dealerships for a short time. It's good to be home. It's good to see it you is. there in your in your dungeon with a good mic in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about the uh, the production value of the last couple of weeks. We uh, were on the road, Jeff, and um, it was great to see dealers again. It was great to get back out there. Hopefully, uh, everything stays uh, stays safe enough for us to to go to NIADA next week, right? Yeah, yeah. Masks or not, I'm heading in there. Um, w- TIADA was so awesome though, Luke. I mean, we had such a great time. Like all I can say is thank you, like humbled and honored to show up into a place with a bunch of great dealers, many, many from Texas, but a lot from outside Texas. And we, it was just fun to meet people and put faces to names and and just like when you have a someone come up to you and say, Hey, I listen to your podcast every Thursday. I know that, you know, I know your voice from it's like that's so humbling. It's crazy to think that anyone listens to this. It's, it is crazy, Jeff. So yeah, I remember I said one time, maybe, I'm not sure if you were standing around or not, and the guy walks up to me and I introduced myself to him and they said, uh, oh, I know who you are. I listen to you every week. I'm like, what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, there's actually people that listen, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's surprising. But again, thank you guys for doing it. Uh, thank you for subscribing and thank you for leaving us a review. Um, the iTunes review and the Spotify reviews are huge. It, it what keeps the podcast growing and getting out to more dealers when they search up education, things like that. So if you have not reviewed us, that is our only ask. We will never charge. We will never <laughs> come to your dealership and steal your cats. So subscribe and review, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If not, we will find you. Um, let, let's talk about some of your takeaways from TIADA, people who weren't there or weren't able to make it. Um, we want to give you guys our notes uh, and hopefully educate you or help kind of our main takeaways? I tell you, um, just the staff at TIADA, Jeff Martin and Teresa, just put together a convention like, honestly, I hadn't seen. Um, yeah. It was comparable to national and um, just wonderful and, and so many takeaways. You know, I, I hate to say it, but the panel that you and I hosted in the, in the podcast, sorry, again, sorry about the audio, we had some technical difficulties. Hopefully we'll improve that this coming week. But, uh, you know, being on that or, or hosting that panel with dad, uh, with Danny and Chad were really eye-opening to me. Um, it, it made us rethink the way we buy some cars off the street. And uh, we're doing something differently now to try to, to try to take that game to the next level. It really re-energized me on what needs to be done. Yeah, it's so, I mean, again, it's the whole point of these things. You don't know what you don't know. You know, you just don't know. You're like, oh, well, I, I sure I can send out some Craigslist messages and some Facebook. And then you see a dealer who's taken it to a whole nother level with a whole nother angle and a different comp plan for his buyers. And then it's just like, wow, that is crazy. I never would have thought of that. And if I did, I never would have thought that it could work. And yet I see this dealer doing it. So can I. That, that's funny. You, you say that. How many times have I seen somebody doing something and go, well, that would never work. Yeah. And then they show you the numbers and show you that it does work. And you go, man, have I been that wrong about so many different things? And I mean, apparently I have. <laughs> I'd say you're wrong I, about most stuff, but yeah. Probably, probably so, but I mean, October, we've been in business for 36 years and you go, I mean, is there anything new to learn? Yes, there's plenty of new to learn. And that's what's great about the convention. Mm-hmm. Well, one of my other takeaways was the importance. So I have a service shop and I know not all the dealers listening have service on site or even remote, whatever, but the importance of service, um, not only from a customer service standpoint, generally speaking, but the service inside your repair bays, your service bays is so crucial, right? Like we all know that we're trying to make these cars run longer. We're trying to stretch them out. We're selling stuff with more miles. We're, We're having to fix the, the ones that we wouldn't have fixed otherwise, we don't see that changing for a while, right? Like I, I can't just scrap out a two or thousand, three thousand dollar car because it's not worth repairing. Now it's worth repairing. Even if I got to put a three thousand dollar engine into the thing, it's still worth five or six. So now the economics work out for me. But I'm dealing with a rougher car. I'm dealing with parts shortages and trying to find this freaking 
timing cover for a Nissan Altima that has been delayed for two weeks and I got an angry customer. So finding, and then you, if you add in the fact that maybe in the future we're all squashed, right? And Carvana and Carhop and all these other dudes come in and put us out of business and start selling cars remotely, but they're not looking to service cars remotely, right? So worst, worst case scenario, I shut down my sales side and now I'm a service center for all the Carvana cars, right? I, I don't know, but just how important that service side of your dealership is it totally hit me it's it's the it's the hardest thing to do in your dealership number one um, is keeping customers happy and keeping their cars serviced getting cars ready for the front line it's the hardest thing it gives us 90 percent of our headaches but it is by far the most important thing um like you said you got to have a backup your backup mm -hmm. is selling cars is is servicing them and if you do it right you can make a lot of money doing it so uh, training is so important, um, weekly service meetings, learn how to, you know, learn to train your service advisors, how to sell service properly, learn to train your technicians on how you want cars inspected so that when you sell the cars, you don't get that immediate you know, policy work. What you, you know, what you don't want is a lot of policy work. You understand warranty work because engines fail, transmissions fail, AC stop working. Yeah, all those things happen, but what yeah. you don't want is to sell a car and then next week the person be back and they didn't balance them properly. Yeah, yeah, or they left a bolt loose or something you guys overlooked in the recon process because you were either lazy or incompetent or yeah, your quality control wasn't there. And, and what's funny to me is, again, it's the same argument that we don't give it the attention it needs. I'm willing to have a lot tech I'm willing to have a title girl. I'm willing to have a receptionist and a payment taker up front to support my sales staff, BDC agents, all the technology in the world, all the money. But, and then my service shop, I'm like, hey man, you get three texts and I expect my service writer to do, you know, 50 tickets a week. And you guys also got to detail, do tires and, you know, put stickers on it. It's like, <laughs> okay, well, no matter what, or you're not running efficiently. What, one, little, one little trick that, that I think that will help this with people. You drive your cars typically before you inspect them, correct? Well, after the service work is done, go back and redrive it again because it's just that little extra 15 minutes that make a huge difference in the way your cars are before they get to the front line. Mm -hmm. Just my opinion. Just a little and have, and have like, someone else do it. Don't have the mechanic oh, yeah. do it. Two different, right? two different people doing that job. Yeah, either either your service writer or your your C mechanic or maybe your lot tech or someone who you trust knows the feel and 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 the way a car should be. Um, we do that. We try to put you know fifteen five to fifteen miles on them. Uh, we start our cars every single week. I start every car on the lot. And I run let it run for thirty minutes to you know make sure the AC is still working, make sure it doesn't overheat. Try to catch all those things. And yet still, it yep. will break down the very next day I sell it. Set expectations That's to your customer. I always set the expectation to your customer uh -huh. when you're selling extra product. Say, so, you know, Mr. or Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Customer, I can guarantee you one thing. And they'll look at you like, what? Your car is going to break down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's just, yeah. just the way it is. Just right. the way it is. Right, right, right. And, and then being able to communicate after the fact. Again, another blaring thing is, Hey man, if my car was in the repair shop and it was, um, I expect that service writer to call me at least daily, at least every day at five o'clock to give me an update as to why I haven't picked up my car yet. Why would our customers expect anything less? You know, and do we have a process to communicate and can we document it inside of your DMS or your service software? You know? Yeah. You know, I, I think I heard Marshall may have said this last week, but, uh, no communication means bad news typically in a customer's mind. So make sure you're doing that. <laughs> and, and it absolutely is bad news. And that's why my guys are that's calling it. them. That's right. Um, and, and, and the stat that they quoted, I don't remember who it was, but they said 15% of all repair work is done at OEM repair shops. So out of all the repair work dollars being spent in your community, only 15% is going to the OEM new car store. So there's a huge opportunity to capture bad repair work um if you've got your shop set up for it yeah i think tim kent said that in, in one of the sessions we went to at ti ada and it was that was an interesting figure because i think he said you know less than 30 years ago that number was like 85 percent 
Um, so it's changed. There's more independent dealers with uh, repair facilities. There's more independent uh, shops out there, your Jiffy Lubes, your places like that, mm -hmm. uh, that are really taking some of that OEM uh, and franchise money. So the more of that we can get, the better off we'll be in the long run. Yeah. And this really, I mean, part of the philosophy of all this is that the, uh, again, I don't know who it was. I think it was one of the keynotes shared the quote, the Wayne Gretzky quote of, you know, great players skate to where the puck is going to be. You know, yeah. and a lot of us, we don't know exactly where it's going to be in a year, five years, 10 years. But when you have a pretty good intuition and you see the trends, you don't want to be the last one to get on the bus. You don't want to be the last one to get there. Have a have some foresight, have some guts, believe in yourself and start skating to where you think that puck's going to be in a year or five years. You know, set yourself up to be on the front of that that way. You know, and that, and that takes him. Uh, so many of us entrepreneurs are. Um, especially in the car business, feel like we're always behind Jeff. And so it's hard to get to where the puck is, is going. That's the reason, again, you have to train your staff well so they can do the jobs and you can look to where the puck's going to be. That's really what it takes. It's not about um, doing your job, your other people's job, and, and being front line. You've got to be back so you can see where it's going. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Great. So when I got home and I realized my service shop was broken, I've been back there for the last week and a half, right next to my service writer, looking at his processes, rebuilding it, asking him why we're doing it this way. How about we do it this way? But then what I found was I was then actually just service writing for the next couple of days. And I'm like, what, what, wait, wait, wait a minute. Like, it's one thing to go back there and learn the process, see where it's broken and help reguide them. But now I need to get out of here, sit down, write a policy and then hire someone who's competent to, to uh, you know, follow through on that new policy and procedure that, that we've revamped. So that's the biggest thing, Luke. Don't get caught so much rowing the boat that you're not up captaining the boat. That's, you know, I wrote down here, Jeff, that why do we find something that works and stop, and, and then we stop doing it? So I had Marshall and Eric uh, in last week or two weeks ago when we were going to CIADA, and we, uh, it's it's always nice to have other dealers into your dealership to kind of look and see what's going on and, and what is broken. And last year when we were selling a lot of cars, we made sure that every time the car came in, we had them on the website. Our website was full. We were doing all these things properly. And then I changed the process. And when I changed the process, it broke everything. Mm. And then I didn't retrain on the new process. Mm -hmm. So they were like, hey, why, why, why'd you quit doing this? So, well, uh, I got lazy and, and that's what happened. So always when you get back, look at where your process is, look at what's going on and figure out how to, how to fix it and go train. Jeff, the biggest thing you talk about hopping in and doing things, it's, that's really not the way it's supposed to be done. What you're supposed to do is look at the process, figure out what's broke and then train your staff to do what they're supposed to be doing, not do their job for a couple of days. Cause that, that always creates a little bit of problem. Yeah, yeah, and obviously it's not the best use of your time. No. Figure out the process, write it down, and then get everybody to sign off on that process that they're committed to running it the way that and, you and guys your have job agreed. Is, yeah, and your job is to inspect the process, right? right? Yeah. Once you put that process in, train on it and inspect it. Make sure it's not broken because the minute you turn your back on that process and don't inspect it, the process falls apart until it is muscle memory. Yeah. And, and that hurts too with turnover. And when you're short staffed, because now someone's doing two jobs and they can't actually get to all of them. So they stop doing part of their job. And then when they do hire someone, they never train that person on that part of that job because they weren't doing it to begin with because they couldn't get to it. And, and honestly, honestly it, uh, yeah. It's your job to train too. Um, just remember that one of the biggest things about being a business owner, especially at the size we are, is mm -hmm. to train. You should... If you don't have, and at our size, we honestly don't have the ability to have a full size, full time trainer on staff. But um, it's our job as as the owners to train our staff. Yeah, what an interesting. Uh, it's it's like a really interesting mind switch that that we should be making. You know, if if you, I don't know what size of dealership. Maybe once you get past ten employees or twelve employees, you know, you really do need to stop being the doer and stop be, start being the, the, the visionary, the steerer, the trainer, 
And you need to look at all those tasks that are taking up your time and distracting you from meeting with your employees and inspecting processes and training. And, and you don't have to look at it like you're, yeah, you are looking over everyone's shoulders and yes, you are correcting them. And yes, you are, you know, hopefully in the right spirit, teaching them the way that you want it done at your dealership. Um, but, but that's what you have to do instead of just burying your nose in your office, you know, digging through paperwork or searching auction lists all day long. Right. This definitely is easy for us to fall back to that position, especially if, if times are good. Um, and so times for me were really good last year, but then all of a sudden we started losing staff. Well, we're losing staff because I, I wasn't training enough. Right. Mm. Um, and people didn't have a direction that they felt modeled where they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And so you lose staff, uh, then you get tired. Well, I don't have enough people to train. I'll just start doing people's jobs. So it's, yep. it's a snowball, snowball effect. And, and that's the issue I ran into was I would be doing the work instead of taking that hour to find someone because yeah. I get so frustrated to be sitting in Indeed and sitting in Facebook, you know, uh, job postings and just getting nowhere and just being so frustrated with the hiring process which is a whole other podcast we need to get into sometime because it is the biggest thorn in my side right now. Um, but, but I wouldn't realize that's the better use of my time than actually doing the job is finding someone to do the job. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, hiring's hard. Um, it's always, it has been hiring the right people are always hard. Just, uh, once you find them, you got to train them. Yeah. Uh, Luke, let's move on. Any other, uh, takeaways you have from last week? Um, Auditing your website, uh, the VDPs and the forms. Um, we were uh, that when we were sitting in that one uh, session, I, I started thinking about that. So what, you know, what is broken with my website? So you go to your website and you start looking at things, and then you notice, well, um, again, our process broke down. Why are the pictures cars turned that way when they're supposed to be this way? Mm. Why is there not enough light in that picture? Why don't mm -hmm. we have the amount of pictures we say we're supposed to have? Um, so you go ahead and audit your website once a day or so and just pick any random car and look at it. And then the other, the part of the auditing your website was the forms, the short forms we get customers to fill out. Mm. Well, send a test through, look at it on, on the backside, see yeah. how easy it is to fill it out. See what type of response you get. All these type of things, because if a form is broken, you're losing leads. If, mm. uh, if the customer can't figure out, well, where's the submit button here? Yeah, it, it disappears. Yeah, or and, it doesn't work on your cell phone or whatever. And do it from your cell phone. That's the number one thing I think dealers don't realize. They're sitting in front of computers, so they just jump on their computer. And they're like, yeah, everything looks great. Yeah. But get on it from your cell phone, because that's where 80% of your customers are accessing your website is through your cell phone. And maybe you need to do one on an iPhone and one on an Android, because maybe the layout's just a little bit quirky. People, and all of a sudden, have you Androids? Uh, I think some of them do, yeah. Oh, okay. um, and you realize that the submit button actually doesn't show up if you're in Android, but it did show up when you're in Apple. So there are those little nuances, guys, and don't expect your website provider to catch that <laughs> because even though we all have cookie cutter websites, there are things that are broken that apparently no one has told them are broken. Yeah. And, and it's, it's affecting your website. That, that's like, you know, when uh, you have a storm and all of a sudden the power goes out at your house and you, you don't you don't bother to call your power company and say, hey, um, I don't have power because my neighbor's going to call, right? Yeah. Well, then after about eight hours, you go, huh? What if maybe my neighbor called? <laughs> maybe <it's, laughs> or maybe it's just me. So make sure you, you check that and call your website provider if there is a problem because it can be fixed pretty easily. Yeah. Well, one thing that also hit me, Luke, and, and uh, throw a plug in for our sponsors. Um, you know, the guys over at Buckeye have done a great job. Um, they have completely thrown their hat in the ring for Buy Here, Pay Here. And that's one thing that really kind of jumped out to me was, um, you know, I guess these guys have got more money than they know what to do with. And they decided to hitch their wagon to, you know, independents, buy here, pay here, subprime guys, you know, dirt lots. They are really going all in on um, helping them, right? I mean, they, they're not you. just reinsurance. They're trying to get into consulting. They want to get into performance groups. Um, so, uh, you know. We were on a, uh, I was on a panel with, uh, Jason Gosnell and uh, um, Sean was doing the uh, um, moderating when we were at CIADA and the amount that I thought I knew about reinsurance that I, that I still don't is amazing. But let me tell you, the guys at Buckeye, they are so knowledgeable 
and they will point you in the right direction. And I've said this so many times, the only way to gather wealth, lessen your tax burden is by having a reinsurance company in the car business. It will mitigate so much risk. You can take some of it, you can farm some of it out, but in the end, reinsurance is the way to go, right? Yeah. And someone in the Facebook group the other day was asking about Deal Shield and if they thought it was worth it and blah, blah, blah. And the only thing that came to mind, I didn't have time to respond. I hope someone yeah. has is re Deal Shield yourself. That's you right. know, reinsure your purchases at the auction. And and I know that the guys at Buckeye offer that product. PSI, that's right. And and that's yeah. a uh, and you know, it's one thing to be able to send the car back, but it's also one thing to be able to take that risk on yourself because if I'm buying, you know. 50 cars a month and I'm paying Mannheim an extra $150 a car, that's a lot of money that's going down the drain when I could reinsure that and, and really only cost myself maybe two grand in bad problems a month, right? Yeah, don't think you're going to win, guys. That's the funniest thing about insurances, right? Like guarantee you the second that you actually start to beat Mannheim and Deal Shield, they will cut <laughs> you off or they will they raise will, your rates, right? They will raise your rate, I guarantee yeah. you. They're doing the math. They know your claim ratios, just like your insurance companies do. So they are making money on this product. You should make it yourselves. So anyways, the guys at Buckeye, uh, the other thing that I, I kind of followed up with that was, um, man, I can, tracking insurance is, is the death of me, right? And, and maybe this is a personal problem and maybe someone can help out, but I getting the little letters, knowing who's covered, who's not covered, excluded drivers. It just seems like it's getting worse and worse and worse. So a full-time person, that's all they do. Right. And that's ridiculous. There <laughs> should be a software out there that communicates with my DMS and communicates with the insurances, whatever data feeds they send out and compares the two, you know, I think be. they're out there. I've called a few and when I get a good name, I'll let you guys know. Um, but then my reinsurance guy says, well, just get you know, gap waiver, you know, total gap and stop it, you know, or, you know, some people you use BSI, both. but yeah. anyways, I think you do both. yeah, th there's products out there to save your butt and save yourself headache and time. Um, Luke, a couple more points. Well, yeah, I see you have down here the P, uh, PTI um, on a successful loan. And um, that was, I think we talked about that at 20 group, didn't we, Jeff? Uh, it could have been, yeah. But that's, um, so, so that's payment to income ratio for those out there that, that wonder what PTI is. Um, go ahead, payment. I was, we, we had that conversation at the dinner. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, the, the, the Gora took us to dinner and. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. That and conversation it, with their underwriter. That's right. And he was talking about lengthening the term has less to do with success of a loan compared to PTI. Wasn't that the argument? Yeah, yeah. He said he said 18% gross to payment uh, is the number. Is the number. You can, you can keep That's your right. payment under 18% of gross income, gross income. He didn't care about rents or other car payments. He just said 18% of gross income is the number one factor on a loan success, which is super interesting. You know, we talk about down payment. We talk about some of these other things. Um, and obviously this applies for buy here, pay here. It also applies for CAC dealers and anyone who cares about the health of their portfolio yeah. um, or their pool. Um, man, that's hard to get to, man. I, I think about my gross, average gross income for my customers and I'm, I'm like maybe 1800 bucks, I think average. Well, if I were to take a stab at it and 18% of that is. I go on net, okay? And um, I don't know what 18% of gross looks like when you, when you compare it to net, you know, I want everybody below 20% of net. Yeah, um, probably safe. So I think I'm safe of that 18%. The one thing I will allow it to go over is when you start selling products, because those products help defer some of the costs. So let's say if I could, if I've got somebody that we originally booked them at their, their initial payment was less than 20%. And then we add a 36 month warranty. And I'm and I'm going to 22%. I'm okay with that because mm -hmm. I know that that they're not going to have that extra cost. And maybe that's not the best way to look at it. But I, I think 
there's got to be a little bit of, of that in there. Yeah. Too. You're banking that the warranty or any of these other products, not only are they profit center to you, but they're also protecting the collateral for a little bit longer or some sort of a value add to the customer because now you've got them on VSI and they don't actually have full coverage insurance, but sure. Some of those factors, but I mean, really what it boils down to is affordability, right? It, he's basically saying, one. if you have an affordable car, they will always make the car payment. And that's a tough balance. <laughs> it's a tough balance. And the one thing I would argue against his concept, and, and really it's, I'm not sure it's a valid argument on my, my case, because mm -hmm. if you go, okay, if I stretch the length of the loan out to 60 months, which I would never do, but if, let, let's just say I did, to get people's car note under that 20% net, at what point am I going to have to trade them? Am I going to have to start trading them earlier? So if I start trading them earlier in the car as cash, well, I'm actually going to lose money on that ACV on the backside. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is, is it going to affect my default rate enough to stretch it out to make that money back? And I, I just, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that. Yeah. You know I mean, as of right now, your ACVs are higher than what you anticipated them to be when you originated these loans 12 or 24 months ago, right? Sure. So, so everyone's in a much healthier situation now. If that flips the other direction aggressively, then your people are going to be upside down much, much, much longer, right? And it's you can't not, trade them yeah. as soon. It's phony profit that you're never going to realize because you're it's going to trade, if. trade it it's, out. It's not if. It's going, to, it's going to flip. Well, I mean, not aggressively, let's say. If it goes on a normal depreciation curve, which, of course, it will. That's fine, but um, uh, I, I don't know, man. I inflated car values. I think you're here. It's it's, it's here for not a bit. inflated, but but it's taken a step up, right? Just like every asset class has jumped up. That's a whole other argument. Uh, Luke, any final parting words for the? Um, one thing that we learned also in a session was about this negotiating on payments, um, and, and I'm always looking for things to train my salespeople with, because we can train on the same things a lot and they get good at those things. But then all of a sudden an issue comes up where I don't have a word track for it, or we didn't negotiate properly or somebody's coming to me saying their payments are too high. So um, how often are we presenting our, our salespeople presenting the lowest down payment and the lowest payments possible? Because, you know, someone walked in with $500 down and needing a $250 a month car payment. So, mm they negotiated first with us mm -hmm. by presenting what they had and we got yeah. that out of them. And when we go back, that makes, oh my God, yeah. Well, manager, they told me all they had was $500 down yeah, and, and they could only afford $250 a month. Well, you know, what we should be presenting them on, on first, you know, first right now would be, hey, you know, $3,000 down and $500 a month, if they can afford that. Now, if, if they can't afford it with, at that 18% of gross, then we can go back. But make sure that you're training your sales staff to uh, let the customer win, right? Mm. Go, go with something first that you know you can negotiate down from. Because if you walk in and, and you don't let that customer win, nine times out of 10, you're not going to sell them a car. Go mm. in, give them a... a uh, not a big, not a number to run them off, but a yeah. number that's that's true to market and see what you can do there. Because um, in the end, if you can let that customer win just a little bit, you're going to be better off in the long run. Yeah. And I just think that it also gives you something to then take off the table later on, you know, or, or oh, to yeah. win. Like, hey, you know what, if I can shave an extra 30 bucks off your payment, you're, you're okay with the bumper being scratched and we're going we're gonna to let that slide, right? If I could save yep. you 30 bucks on your payment, we won't fix that. Okay, perfect. You know, so for sure, it leaves you so many room to negotiate. And I also like when you say you do contract them at that higher rate, now it's much easier when they come back to you in six to 12 months and tell them, tell you, hey, I can't afford this payment. I, I, I need a lower payment. Okay, great, Mr. Customer, no problem. We can get that lowered for you because you started high. If you start low, sure. there, there ain't nowhere to go in six to 12 <laughs> months if they need to refi. I've, I've had so many customers walk in that, you know, that we gave them a $300 a month payment uh, because that's what they needed. And then five months later, walk in, I need a $200 a month I need a 200 yeah, 250 <laughs> There's nothing I can do. I'm sorry, Mr. Gus, right? You know, yeah. and, you know that's, that's gonna happen. But uh, make sure you, you start with a, a shorter term than you would normally go, a higher mm -hmm. down payment than you will take, and yeah. a 
and a higher car payment than they were expecting because that gives you three spots to negotiate. Yep. And I promise you, you give them one or two of those spots, you're going to be great. Yep. And, and, and here's the thing. Right now, a, a lot of our customers are getting that earned income child tax credit advance check every month. Um, it will be padded into their bills. It will be part of their income. Even if you don't count it as income for them, they mentally are calculating that into their income. That's so when they say, hey, well, normally I could afford a $300 payment, but now that I'm getting these child tax credits, sure, I could do 400 a month or 500 a so, month. Get that while you can. And when the tax credits dry up and they don't have that extra amount, then renegotiating with them. But it's going to be padded into their payment somewhere, whether it's a second car or whether they move into a nicer house or whether they add two more cell phones to their plan, they'll spend it somewhere. So Jeff, yesterday was the first time I'd had this uh, on a, uh, a collections call. The customer said, I'm waiting on my earned income tax monthly check. I, uh, they don't put it directly in. They, they mail me a check. So I'm waiting on that. I hadn't gotten it yet. I hadn't gotten it yet. Yeah. And we said, hold on, hold on. When we sold you this car, that didn't even exist. Why? Yeah. Why are you bringing that up now? Exactly. Right? So it's coming. <laughs> yep. They have mentally calculated it into their income to cover their bills. So they went out and got something else or they went to Vegas or they're, and some of them are genuinely using it to get caught up on things. I get that. Sure. But sure. those that are caught up, they will find a place to spend it. So hopefully you know, you're getting some of it in those payments while you can. Luke, uh, next week, what are we, three, four days away from seeing you down in San Antonio? If you guys are listening to yeah. this, it's the 19th of August. Um, you have got three days to book your flight and get down to San Antonio. If you haven't already done so, they will let you register the day of the 23rd, the 24th, the 25th. You can register right then. Flights are not that expensive. Hotels were not that crazy down there. Um, just come. Take yeah, a couple days off and come down to convention if you're not already planning on it. And it's not that hard to drive if you're, uh, you know, you know, if somewhere in the middle of the country, not, not too hard to get to if you, can't, if you can't fly. But be there. We hadn't talked about this a lot, Jeff, but we are going to be doing at least six episodes. And they're going to be probably many episodes next week. Mm -hmm. in conjunction with NIADA, we will be doing a morning podcast that may not get onto Apple Podcasts straight away. So check us out on uh, where we decided Facebook Live or something to that effect, Jeff, something yeah. like Facebook Live. And then our afternoon podcast will kind of be a rewrap and an interview um, from that day's either, you know, someone, some session we went to that we really liked. Uh, we're going to try to get some really good names that people should know that are educators. Um, I believe we're going to try to get the new 20 group moderators on at least once. Um, and we're going to be in the dealer lounge inside the expo is what we understand for the late afternoon broadcast. Right, Jeff? Yes. So absolutely worst, worst case scenario. You can't make it. We should be bringing you guys some good content, some of it live, some of it pre-recorded and hopefully posted timely. So even if you can't make it, you can still feel like you're there. Um, but and, obviously and we hope us, to see you there. Shoot us uh, a Facebook message. If you want us to track somebody down that, and we will, and any dealer that wants to talk to us, Hey, come say hello. If you got an interesting story, but Hey, maybe we'll do a podcast with you. So I yeah. never know. Awesome. Okay, Luke. Well, see you in a couple of days. Yes, sir. So glad you joined us. Please take a minute to leave us a review and share this podcast with a friend, the independent dealer podcast dealers, helping dealers.